Uh, so, uh, hi, I'm Gilad. Uh, this talk is called Clustering of Web Attacks, but it's actually about telling stories, well, stories about attacks on web applications. And uh, what happens is that today we have many security solutions that protect web applications. And what they do besides protecting, besides protecting them is they also output many alerts, actually tons of alerts, a lot of alerts. And there is a very big need to find the stories or the essence behind all this huge amount of alerts. So this talk uh, is not about how to tell the stories, but it's about how to find the stories that are worth telling. Um, and it's also a walk outside the lab because uh, I'm going to share with you some of the dilemmas and some of the decisions we had to make on the way in order to get what we wanted to be uh, in, the, in the clustering of the web application attacks. So first, let, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gilad, um, I have a master degree in mathematics and my background is mostly related to statistics, machine learning, mathematics. Uh, I work at Imperva. Imperva is a security company uh, that have a wide uh, range, a wide spectrum of uh, security products that protects uh, web application but also databases, file shares, etc. Um, and what I do there uh, is I'm a researcher and I work on the web application part of the company and uh, my work is mostly related to uh, developing new products that are related to web application. Uh, so that's it about Imperva, I'm not going to mention it again in this talk. Uh, sorry, I don't know it together. Um, let's, uh, wh what I'm going to say today is, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, first I'm going to discuss why is it good, why we should cluster web application attacks and find the stories behind them. Then I'm going to share with you our solution, how we did it, and some of the decisions we had to make. And finally, I'm going to uh, share with you some of the results, some of the stories that we found uh, behind the attacks. So let's start with uh, the background about how we protect web applications and uh, what are the alerts that we find, find them. So, in order to protect web application, one possible way to do it is to use something called a web application firewall, or WAF for short. Now, a WAF is a, a network component uh, that basically filters uh, requests that goes to the web application. It's a firewall that separates the web application from the outside world, and every request that uh, is sent from the outside world to the web application is filtered by the WAF. The WAF decides whether it is an attack and then stops it, or it is a legitimate request and let it go through. Uh, and there are many, many kind of WAFs. Uh, I'm not gonna go into how the WAF works, but uh, the one thing I'm gonna say is that besides uh, the fact that the WAF stops the attacks, it also reports them. And what the user of the WAF gets is uh, a log, a log of all the alerts that he found. So here is a log, for example. Um, that's a truncated log, where you can see, for example, the IT, the type of the attack, the targeted URL, and the country from which the attack came from. And usually the log contains much more attributes, but let's look at this, for example. And uh, if we look closely, we might be able to find some kind of pattern behind the attacks. Uh, but doing it this way, it's kind of hard, so let's rearrange them a little bit. And yeah, we, we actually can't find the stories behind them, the stories behind the log. For example, there's a story for, uh, about a scanner from China uh, doing many kinds of attacks, but as you can see, uh, all the attacks are coming from the same subnet, the same class C. There's another story about a comment spammer from Russia, uh, which, com which is coming from many different IPs, but uh, targeting the same pattern, uh, pattern URL, right? News backslash some topic backslash comments. And there's another story about a remote code, a remote code execution attack uh, that is always targeting the same URL, index.php, but coming from many different uh, countries, from distributed origin. So yeah, if we look closely, we might be able to arrange the alerts in some kind of way to find the stories behind them, but in real life, it won't really work because in real life, we don't have just about 15 or a couple of dozens of alerts. Uh, let's say that a customer usually uses a WAF on a couple of servers, a couple of web applications, and 
Uh, it gets around a couple of hundreds of thousands up to a couple of millions uh, of alerts a day. So it just can be practically done manually. There, there's a need to find an automatic way to find the stories behind them. And that is uh, what we're trying to do. We're trying to take the alert. Each alert captures a single suspicious uh, request. And we're trying to narrow them down uh, to a couple of clusters, uh, maybe a couple of dozens of clusters, where each cluster tells a, tells a story. And the, cl the cluster captures some kind of wider phenomenon about the attack, like the origin of the attack, what was the intent, uh, sorry, the uh, intent of the attack, uh, maybe what was the target. Uh, so that's basically what we're trying to do. As, uh, and uh, we, we want to give uh, the customer some kind of uh, let's say a report about what happened uh, what happened to you yesterday what kind of attack did you find for example uh, if you see the SQL injection attacks on 18 of your service coming from the same subnet and this attack contained about 11k alerts it's much easier seeing it this way rather than seeing 11k separate alerts and trying to figure out what's the common thing about them or a vulnerable server uh, from China is targeting your web ser WordPress servers uh, using specific WordPress vulnerabilities. So that's some kind of story that we can tell. Uh, but in order to do so, we need to construct the clusters, right? To, to find the pattern or tell the stories behind the alerts. So I, I said the word clustering a couple of times. Let me just elaborate a little bit. So. Uh, clustering is some kind of, uh, it's an area of research in machine learning, mostly in machine learning. Uh, machine learning is some, an area of research in artificial intelligence. And the goal of clustering is to take data and group it in such a way that two items in the same group are more similar to one another than two items in different groups. And for example, if we want to cluster uh, a scatter plot in the plane, we can do it, for example, in this way where each color represents a different cluster. And clustering is not a specific algorithm, but it's some kind of family of algorithms. Uh, there are many different kind of clustering algorithms, uh, but every clustering algorithm that uh, you will find have basically three basic ingredients. And the basic ingredients are first the data, right? First you need to decide on what the data we want to input the algorithm. And it's not just to decide what data, but it's also how you want to structure the data. And now we want to uh, enhance the raw data that you get. The second, uh, the second ingredient is to find a distance measure between two data points. I mean, when you want to cluster like scatter plots, it's very easy to calculate the distances. But we're trying to cluster attacks on web applications, and we're trying to find a way to know when two attacks are similar to one another. That's not such an easy, ta easy task to do, and we need to find a way to, to do it. And I'll, I'll talk about it later. And the third ingredient is to choose the algorithm. So this algorithm should take the data, it should take the distance measure, and it should somehow digest it and output the clusters or the stories. Uh, and we need to find the right algorithm for us. And we'll see that actually for us it was quite, quite a challenge to, to choose the algorithm that will work good for us. So I'm going to share with you our solution, how we did it. Um, uh, and discuss all the three basic ingredients, the data, the distance measure, and the, uh, and the clustering algorithms that uh, kind of worked for us in, the, in, in, in relation to web application attacks. So let's start with the data. Um, every web application attack is basically an HTTP request. Uh, and that's the raw data, that's the most, the rawest data that we have. And uh, actually, an HTTP request have quite a lot of information inside of it. For example, we know the method, we know the URL that the attack was targeting. Uh, we know all the headers. Some headers are more important than others. We need to decide which ones. We know the parameters. But finding the, looking at the raw data is not enough. We need some, fa some kind of, weather, well, um, some kind of uh, method to structure it. For example, we might not need all the headers. I mean, there are many headers. Some are, some are rarer than others, uh, and maybe there will just be noise in our data. We need to decide on the right headers for us. 
maybe we want to separate the parameters that are located in the post body from the parameters in the query string. Maybe they have some uh, different mechanics that we need to use. So there are a lot of decisions we have to make about how we want to structure the raw data. And besides the HTTP request, we have some additional data that might help us. Uh, one, one, uh, one important uh, attribute that we have is the IP, the source IP. It may indicate on the origin of the attack, who was the attacker. Uh, another uh, important attribute that we have is the type of the attack, right? The WAF that stops the attack tells us whether it was, for example, an SQL injection or a directory traversal or cross-site scripting. It may also help us to correlate between different attacks. We also know the time of the attack. We are, maybe we are able to correlate between different attacks using their timelines. Uh, when did the attack happen? And sometimes we also have uh, information about the attacked application. I mean, was the attacked application an online store or was it some kind of financial or banking application? It might make a difference for us later on in the clustering. All right, so we have the raw data. But actually, we can extract much more out of it. And this is the phase where we take the data. Uh, th this phase is called feature extra extraction. And that's where we take the raw data and we extract more out of it. We take, uh, let's say, uh, well, a uh, feature basically is every attribute in the data. For example, the IP is a feature. The URL is a feature. If you want to take the user agent, for example, that's also a feature. So everything uh, we have in the data is a feature. And we want to extract more out of it. Uh, and for example, let's look at a couple of features that we can extract uh, more features out of them. And one of them is the IP. So the IP may indicate on the origin of the attack, right? Who was the attacker? Uh, but we can just looking at the IP, we can tell, we can find out much more. And um, do you have any suggestions? Suggestions? <coughs> what can we find from the IP? Yeah. Yeah, GeoIP location, that's great, yeah. ASN. ASN, yeah, that's great. So, yeah, we, we can find a lot of things from the IP. For example, the geolocation, right? We know the country, the region, uh, the city. Sometimes the country is not enough. I mean, knowing the two attacks came from the U.S. is not a lot of information. The U.S. is huge. And uh, maybe knowing which state in the U.S. might help us more. We also know the exact coordinates of the attack. Uh, the provider, the ASN. Another important uh, attribute that we know is that sometimes attacker use some kind of anonymity framework in order to hide their origin. So knowing whether uh, an attacker uses this kind of anonymity framework might help us later on. For example, if the IP is coming from a Tor node or from some kind of anonymous proxy, it will also help us. So another important feature that we have is the URL. <coughs> The URL may indicate on the target of the attack, what page in, or what resource the, the attacker is targeting. So what, what extra features do you think we can extract from the URL? Not everyone at once. Yeah. Query string. Then? Query string. The query string. We actually separate the query string and use it on, on a separate attribute uh, in the parameters. So. A couple of thing, a couple of features we can extract from the URL. First, the file extension. I mean, is the attacker trying to target a JPEG or an HTML or a PHP page? It it, it makes a difference. Uh, a second thing is, um, is there some kind of pattern in the in the directories that the attacker is trying to target? Like like we saw before that the the attacks on a page called news backslash a topic backslash comments. So sometimes there is a pattern. And another important feature we can extract from the URL is actually information about uh, the attacked application itself. For example, if an attacker is trying to target a page called wp-config, wp-config is a, page, a special page for WordPress application. It may indicate that he's trying to target a, web page, a WordPress application. Mm -hmm. So it's also very important information that we have. Uh, so now we have the data, we have all the features. In, in our algorithm, we have quite a lot of features. I can't, uh, there's not enough time to, to say everything. It's about uh, 40 to 50 different features. Uh, and we, the next thing we need, we need to do is to uh, find a distance measure. That's the second ingredient. Now, if you want to find a distance between two points in a plane, there's an exact formula to do it. It's very easy. But we're trying to do something much harder. Taking two attacks, 
taxonomy applications that have many complex features uh, and find the distance between them. And I'm going to give a couple of methods to, to calculate the distance. Um, so before, before calculating, before uh, showing specific methods, a couple of considera considerations uh, we have to make. So the first the first consideration is that we have a lot of features. Each feature, the, the features are quite different from one another, and we need to find a, a distance measure for each feature on its own. I mean, we can't find a single distance measure that will work for both IPs, URLs, uh, file extensions, etc. We need to look at every, every feature by itself and find its own distance measure. The second consideration is about normalization. Now, by normalization, I mean that all the distances will, will finally be numbers, but they should be normalized or in other ways should be on the same scale. For example, let's say we have two features, feature A, which can have distance between 0 to 1, and feature B, which can have distance between 0 to 100. So that's, that's not on the same scale, right? And if two attacks are very far away from one another compared uh, in feature A, so they'll have, let's say, distance one in feature A. But comparing it to feature B, they are very close to one another. And that's a huge bias in, in the results. So we need to find a distance me the distance measures that will be easy to normalize and to normalize them all in, to be in the same scale. A good scale usually is between zero to one. Uh, that's like, I don't know, a general method, but uh, it's, it's not the only way. And the last consideration is that, well, we have a distance measure for each feature, but that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the distances between attacks. So we need to find a way to take all the distance measures that we found for each feature uh, and sum it up together uh, in order to get uh, some kind of total distance between attacks, the, the attacks themselves, the attacks on the web applications. So let's say a couple of distance measures that might work. Uh, the first uh, distance measure I want to talk about is distances between strings, right? We have a lot of strings in the data. The URL is a string. Uh, the file extension is, is a string. The user agent, many, many features. And the Levenstein distance between, uh, between two strings is just the minimal amount of single character edits you need to do in order to get from the first string to the second. So for example, if you want to, to, to move, to, to, to go from pictures backslash cat.jpg to pictures backslash dog.jpg, uh, you need to do exactly three uh, single character edits. Uh, sorry, by single character edits, I mean you can insert a string, you can delete a string, or you can substitute a string. These are the two single character edits that are allowed in the Levinstein distance. So actually this distance works quite well for URLs, right? It measures some kind of similarity between the strings. But will it work for all of our string features? Uh, and the answer is su surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, no. For example, let's take the file extension, right? Is CSS close to CSV? I mean, CSS is a style sheet page related to HTML. A CSV is a comma separated value. It's like an Excel. They have completely no relation between them. But if you take the Levinstein distance between those two strings or any other string similarity distance, there are many more, they will be pretty close to one another just because the C and the S. So this distance measure won't work for all of, all of our features and we need to find another, another distance measure, for example, for this kind of feature. And actually we have many different features that are strings and the, the fact that the, the strings are similar to one another doesn't have any meaning at all. For example, the country, right? If two countries sound the same, what does it mean? So another method to do, uh, to, to measure distances is called the discrete distance. And that's a very easy distance measure. It will work for any kind of data that you have. And it's just uh, taking two objects and saying, if they are the same, their distance is zero. If they are not the same, their distance is one. So this distance measure is already normalized, right? Between zero to one. It works quite well for certain strings. It will work pretty good, for example, for file extensions, if you want to separate them from one another. And you can also do some kind of weighted discrete uh, distance if you have granular data. For example, we have the country, the region, and the city use, using the geolocation that we extracted before. And we can say that if two attacks are coming from the same country, 
give them some distance x. If two attacks are coming from the same country and the same region, give them distance y, which is smaller. And if two attacks are coming from the same country, region, and city, give them distance z, which is even smaller. So we can do some kind of uh, games with it, use a weighted discrete distance, and that's not such a bad uh, distance measure to work with. Uh, the next feature I want to talk about how to calculate distance uh, from is the IP. Now the IP is a very important feature, it indicates on the origin, and there are many ways to calculate distances between IPs. Uh, and let's talk about a couple of them. So the first one is use the geolocation. I mean, we know the exact coordinates of each IP, right? So we can calculate the distances between uh, every two IPs uh, using the real distances between these coordinates. I mean, if we have an IP from Frankfurt and an IP from Paris, let's calculate the distances between Frankfurt and Paris, and that will be the distance. So that's, that distance function actually doesn't work so well. It's a pretty bad distance function, and there are a couple of reasons for it. So first of all, usually the, the, the real location of the IP doesn't tell us much. For example, two IPs may be close to borders, but come from completely different countries, so the distance between them will be pretty small. Uh, another, uh, another bias that we have is that there are some huge countries in the world, like China for example, and two attacks that are coming from China can be extremely far away from one another, while they do have some correlation between them. Uh, when, for example, two attacks that are coming from different countries in Europe can be pretty close to one another. Uh, and another, <coughs> uh, another disadvantage is that um, it's not so easy to normalize this distance function. I mean, there's no natural way to normalize this distance function to be between, let's say, 0 to 1 or 0 to something. So we need to look at another distance function. And, and in order to do so, we need to look at the structure of the IP. So um, let's talk about first... Uh, I'll only discuss IPv4, and the structure of IPv4 is that every IP is made of four numbers, each number between 0 to 255, right? So we can look at the IP as a four-dimensional data. And we know how to calculate distances between four-dimensional points in the plane. There's an exact formula to do it. It's very easy, usually. And... We can do it this way, but in order to improve the distance function, we need to give different weights to the different parts of the IPs, of the IP, right? Because uh, as you go to the left of the, the left part of the IP, the numbers are more significant than the right part of the IP. So, for example, here we give uh, weights which are one, ten, <coughs> one hundred, and one thousand. And if we, if you want, if you want this distance measure to look more like, uh, let's say, a Euclidean measure or the regular measure that you want, uh, that you know. Uh, you can take the square root of uh, this formula. So this distance function might also look uh, pretty good at first glance, but there are a couple of disadvantages to this to this uh, measure. So the first one is that the weights are pretty much arbitrary. I mean, if you try to calculate distances, you could take other weights. You will maybe you will, you will get better results, maybe not. But they are kind of arbitrary, uh, and there is no natural way to choose them. Uh, and the second disadvantage is that you can normalize this distance function, but uh, it's also not that natural. Sorry. So because the distances in this distance function can be can go from zero to something extremely large, very large. So we need to look at another way at, at the IP. And there is another way to look at IPs, and that is looking at an IP at, as a 32-dimensional data. Uh, and it may sound like a lot of dimensions, but trust me, this distance function is uh, actually pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and every IP, right, is made of four numbers between 0 to 255. That's exactly 8 bits. So 8 times 4 is 32. Each IP is represented in 32 bits. And what we can do is look at the a mutual prefix of two IPs and look at the mutual prefix to the left. Uh, and the distance will be the size of this mutual prefix times 1 over 32. This 1 over 32 is to normalize it, to be between 0 to 1, and do 1 minus the result. That's to get a real distance function. And this is actually a pretty good distance function to work with. Um, 
it does look at the structure of the IP. It's already normalized between zero to one, and it's very easy to inter interrupt what what was uh, the reason that we got the distance. So this works much better than the previous uh, methods uh, to calculate distances between IPs. So let's say we found a way to calculate distance between all the features that we have. So as I said, we have something between 40 to 50 features. But what we re really want to do is to calculate the distances between the attacks themselves, right? We know how to calculate distances between IPs, between URLs, between referrers, etc. But how do we calculate distances between the attacks? So a, pop a common way to do it, or a popular way to do it, is to do what's called the weighted sum of the distances. So the distance between the first attack and the second will be some weight, W1, times the distance between the IPs, plus some other weight, W2, times the distances between the URLs, etc. When we have, uh, let's say, D, uh, WD times the distances between the user agent, and D is the amount of features that we have in the data. But, I mean, where does this Ws came from? Uh, and they are what's called in machine learning hidden weights. Uh, these are the weights that will actually determine our distance function, and we need to find them somehow. So there are a couple of a couple of uh, methods to find uh, mm -hmm. these weights. I'm going to show you two of them. There are, there are more methods. Uh, so the first the first way to find them is to use our domain expertise uh, and uh, trial and error, and just, and just do manual setting. Right, we know the features, we extracted them, and we should know which features are more important than others. Then we can do some kind of trial and error uh, and manually set the features. Uh, and it works pretty good if you have a lot of data. There are a couple of disadvantages. First, it's hard to generalize this result. Uh, and the reason is that when we do this kind of manual setting, we do it on a couple of data sets. Uh, right, a couple of a couple of uh, trials and errors, uh, but when we do, when we want the algorithm to work in real life, it will work on data sets that it never seen before. So it's pretty hard to generalize something that we do manually. And the second thing is that it's a lot of work. I mean, trust me, that's a lot of work to doing it, doing it manually. Uh, it can be done, uh, but uh, it takes a lot of time. So another method to do it, is a more structured method, and that is uh, using supervised learning. So supervised learning in machine learning, uh, it's the more, uh, let's say, common practice in machine learning where, where you get labeled data, and you want to predict something related to the data. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so we need to get labeled data about our, our features, about, about our data, about our clusters, and it's not so easy, the way to, to, to get label data is to take a data set and cluster it manually. I mean, manually finding the clusters themselves. And we need to decide on which labels to give and what actually will go into the supervised learning algorithm. And the data that we have is we take every two pairs of alerts, right? Every two pairs of alerts. And each two pairs of alerts will get a label. And the label will be either if they are in the same cluster or if they are not in the same cluster. So what we have now is uh, many pairs of alerts. Each pair of alerts, we know whether it is in the same cluster or not in the same cluster, and we use some kind of classification algorithm to, to find the weights. And it might sound, I don't know, a bit fuzzy, but actually it's a very common practice in machine learning. It's like the, the most basic, uh, um, let's say, task that when you when people learn machine learning, they do. It's like classification, a binary classification, when you have either true or false. I'm not going to go into how it can be done, but if, we, if, if you uh, read a little bit about machine learning, you see that it's not that hard. Uh, there are also a couple of disadvantages to this method. And the first one is that it's very hard to get the unlabeled data. I mean, to get, uh, sorry, the labeled data. Because to get the labeled data, you need to take a data set and to cluster it manually. And clustering manually is a very hard task to do. I mean, you need to take, let's say, a couple of hundred thousands of alerts and find the patterns manually between them. 
and it's not so easy to, to be done. It can be done, but it cannot be done to many, many data sets because it, it just takes too, too much time to do it. Uh, and the second disadvantage is that this method is uh, prone to overfitting. And this is mostly because we don't have much labeled data. Uh, overfitting is where you get an you, you use some kind of a machine learning algorithm and it's just fixed state on the error that is uh, present on the data itself. So there is a very large problem in uh, related to overfitting basically in all machine learning algorithm and specifically in this one. Uh, so that's also a disadvantage. And the last one is that this method, and th th that's an important one, misses the structure of the cluster. Because let's say we have a cluster with three alerts. And alert A is close to alert B, and alert B is close to alert C. But alert A and C doesn't have much of a relation between them. Like it's, it's some kind of string of alerts. Uh, and this method misses this, this, uh, this kind of structure because we only look at pairs. So the way we did it is uh, we used some kind of composite of the two methods. Uh, we did a kind of manual setting of the of the uh, alerts, and uh, then we used a, a cla uh, sorry a classification algorithm to improve them and to twitch the the weights uh, to be better. Uh, so there are many methods to to find the weights, uh, and actually it's it's not such an easy task to do. All right, so we have the data, we have the distance function, we know how to calculate distances between attacks. We need uh, the last ingredient, right? The algorithm itself. And in the algorithm itself, we used uh, some kind of less common clustering algorithm, which is called the uh, clustering in streaming mode. And the reason is that when we do the clustering, we need somehow to store the alerts in, in memory, right? And we just have too many alerts. I mean, <clears throat> each customer have between a couple of hundreds of thousands uh, to sometimes even a couple of millions alerts a day. And if we want to do it for all of our customers, it's just too much uh, data to store in memory. So we need to find a way to do it in streaming. And in streaming, what we do is we take an alert, we cluster it somehow, we do something with it, and then we throw it away. We don't store the, this alert in memory. Uh, so this is different from the usual uh, batch clustering. In batch clustering, we have all the data in the beginning. We ingest it into some kind of algorithm, and uh, the algorithm outputs the cluster. And that's when people speak about clustering, that's what usually happens the batch clustering. But we had to do clustering in streaming mode and in streaming mode, what happens is that we have some kind of current state of clustering, of clusters, the clusters that are happening right now and we have a new event. Uh, and we need to update the cluster state somehow, like take the event, cluster it, uh, and then output an updated uh, clustering state and then go from this thing, right, from this state, right to the beginning, to get another event, and that's going on all the time online in streaming mode. So we'll focus uh, a little bit about uh, clustering in streaming mode, and there are a couple of uh, consideration considerations we have to make. The first one is that we have a very limited amount of memory, and as I said, we cannot store all the all the alerts in mem in, in the memory. But we can store something, and we need to decide what we want to store uh, in, the mem in, in, in the memory. Uh, and we need to do it in some kind of smart way. The second consideration is that the decisions has to be done in real time, right? Some event goes into the system. We need to cluster it right away, and we need to do something with it, and then draw it away. We can't just wait for a couple of events to come. We want to do it online, in streaming mode. So we need to make the decisions right where when the alerts go into the system. And the third consideration is that we have to we must have an ability to undo our decisions. Uh, and 
when I say undo decisions, for example, if you look at this clustering state, all the points in blue uh, are in the same cluster. So the algorithm decided sometime that this point should be in the same cluster. But after a new event uh, went into the system, it split the cluster. So it undone the decisions that it made before. And we need to find a way uh, to, to, to make the algorithm undo past decisions. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how we did it, but it's kind of uh, it's kind of a technical algorithm, so I, I'm not gonna go into details, just describe in general points uh, what are the methods we used in order to achieve this kind of clustering algorithm. So uh, the, fir the, first, uh, the first thing we did is that we stored aggre aggregated data, uh, statistics about the data instead of the data itself. For example, if a URL was attacked 100 times, instead of storing this URL 100 times in memory, you can store it one time and said that, say that it was attacked 100 times. So it saves a lot of space in memory, um, and we can store this kind of uh, data in, in, uh, in the memory. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is that we are able to undo decisions, but we undo them based on aggregations. Meaning that if we want to take, let's say, an alert and uh, put it out of a cluster, we can't just take, we cannot take a single alert. Uh, we need to take some kind of aggregations of alert and take them out. Uh, so it m does make the algorithm a bit weaker, uh, but for our, uh, for our data, it, it did work pretty good. Uh, and th these are some of the constraints that we had to deal with when we do algorithms that work online and uh, in, in, in real data, like on real data. Uh, and the third, uh, the third thing that we did is we actually used two distance functions, not one. Uh, one distance function, which is a light distance function that doesn't use all the features. It uses just a very small amount of features uh, that we have. And it's very easy and uh, takes uh, a very minimal time to, to, to compute it. And when every time an event goes into memory, uh, we use the light distance function. Uh, and the distance function uh, does actually two things. The, the, the first, things, the, the first uh, things, thing that it does, it tells us when two events should be in the same cluster. It does it very good. Uh, but uh, the second thing is that it, it doesn't tell us when two events shouldn't be on the same cluster. So when the light distance function tells us that uh, two events should be in the same cluster, we said, all right, we trust this distance function uh, and we move forward to the next event. But when it tells us that two events shouldn't be in the same cluster, we don't trust it and we use a heavier distance function. And this heavier distance function considers all the features that we have in the data, all the 40, 50 something uh, features, uh, and it takes much more time to, to compute it, but using this uh, granularity in uh, co uh, computing distances, we're able to do the decisions in real time, make decisions in real, in real time. So that's basically our solution. Uh, the algorithm itself, well, it's kind of technical to go into details, uh, but the, the field of uh, clustering uh, data in streaming mode is actually uh, pretty research. There's much re research in this field uh, and we're not the only one, one uh, ones doing it. So now we have all the ingredients, right? We have the data, we have the distance function and we have the algorithm itself. Let's look at some of the results. Uh, now we tested the algorithm on a couple of data sets. Uh, many data sets and each data set contained um, alerts on a single customer. A single customer uh, doesn't mean a single web application, usually a customer defends a couple of web applications, uh, but a single customer and from a, a time frame of around two days. So each data set is a single customer on two days. Uh, and let's look at a couple of uh, stories that we found. The first story is about attacks on uh, Apache Strat. Apache Strat is a pretty popular framework for developing web applications. It's part of the Apache Software Foundations. And they are 
there were many uh, there were many uh, vulnerabilities released related to Apache Struts and still are released. Uh, so that's that's the story that uh, for example that we can tell about uh, Apache Struts uh, attacks. And what's interesting to see here is first all the attacks came from a single country, China, but from very different IPs, right? So and, and from different regions, and these regions are quite far far away from one another in China. But all the attacks were using the same attack tool, uh, Auto Spider 1.0. And another important uh, attribute of the attack is that. All of the attacks were targeting vulnerabilities of Apache Struts, but different kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, and there are actually vulnerabilities from 2017, 2016, and even 2013. So this attacker uses uh, some kind of distributed network to attack a single customer on a very short time uh, period. And trying all kinds of vulnerabilities of Apache Struts that he may know in order to find the one that works. Uh, because maybe he thinks this customer uses Apache Struts and he can somehow um, man maneuver it or uh, find the vulnerability that will uh, work for him. So that's the first story. The second story is about um, a scanner called uh, OpenVAS. Uh, and OpenVAS is an open vulnerability scanner, a pretty popular one. And the way it usually works is that it sends a couple of requests uh, to open a session uh, in, front of the, in front of the attack application, and then it launches the real attack, uh, where the real attack contained many, many, many alerts, uh, in this case, a couple of thousand, almost two thousand. Um, and uh, the, the kind of attacks are very distributed, very uh, varying from, uh, well, it, it actually tries uh, practically everything, the directory traversal, SQL injection, cross-site uh, scripting, remote code execution, almost everything, uh, and on a very distributed target. But that's not the attack itself, that's more of the attack that happened. The first uh, three rows are the three rows from the last slide. Um, so, Actually, that's not the whole attack. That's not even the whole attack itself. The real attack contained about 45,000 alerts. Uh, that's just a fraction of it. Uh, the, the board is not big enough to show everything. Uh, so basically, what this story tells is not about the origin. It's not about a specific type of attack, but it's about the method that the attacker is using. Because every kind of attack here uh, is first it's, it's targeted on the same customer and it works in the same way. It sends a couple of requests um, to open a session and then it launches the real attack which con contains uh, of something around 2,000 requests every, requests every time. So this is a very spear targeted attack on a single customer from many different places around the world. Uh, you can see Singapore, South Africa, US, Italy and there are many other countries uh, which uh, the, the origin went from uh, to, to attack uh, and all targeting the same customer. So someone is trying to find uh, something that uh, will go through this customer. And we actually find many more stories, sometimes related to the origin, sometimes related to the URL that the, atta the attacker is targeting. Uh, and using the clustering, we can find the real stories that are interesting uh, for 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 the the users of the, the this web application firewall. So I'm going to show with you a couple of next steps of a couple of things that we think about that should be uh, should happen to to this kind of algorithms. The first is, let's say we do the algorithm and we find the clusters, we find the stories. Maybe we can use these stories in order to automatically create or suggest new blocking rules. Right, for example, if we see an attack coming from uh, a single user agent using some kind of tool targeting a specific URL, maybe we can use this kind of attributes of the attack in order to block 
the attacker before it w- even pass the message before we even pass the request itself uh, thus providing extra um, extra protection and extra security for the customers so the the, the second uh, step that we, we can take is we're working basically on data sets uh, of one day two days but not much more maybe we can look at clusters that work across time um, for example let's say we, uh, we have some kind of uh, web application that is attacked every day for a month in the same method maybe we can do some kind of clustering to the clusters that we already saw in order to find some wider phenomena of the attack uh, and find some kind of pattern uh, that, that the attacker is trying to, uh, to, to attack uh, this web application but over a larger period of time and there are many other things that can be done in this area uh, a couple of key takeaways uh, that I think are important from this talk so the first thing is that we have many alerts in the data I mean that's what uh, security products do they protect and they alert uh, mm-hmm. but what we actually want is not many alerts it's just a few stories to understand what really happens in the web application and that's what uh, w- that's what this talk is all about and that's what we're trying to do to take all the huge amount of alerts and to narrow them down to a couple of uh, dozens of stories uh, that are really worth telling and that's really the essence uh, of what's happening uh, when a web application is attacked the second uh, the, the second uh, point is that clustering won't work out of the box I mean it's just it's not like the, the kind of uh, algorithm that you can take the data, put it in an algorithm, and hopefully get clusters. You need to do a lot of work on the process. You need to do a lot of pre-processing to the data. You need to decide what distance measure to take. You need to decide on the right algorithm. Even if you don't work in streaming mode, still there are many different algorithms out there, and you need to choose the right one for you. Uh, and that's not the kind of thing. That, that, that's not the kind of algorithm that will just work out of the box. <coughs> Uh, and the third point is that this field of research of clustering attacks, web application attacks, so cyber attacks in general, it's not a new field of research. There are a couple of academic papers about it, uh, and there, there's been much re- research in this area, but I think there's a lot more research to be done, a lot more exciting uh, attacks to see, especially using different kinds of data, different kinds of attacks or different kind of systems and I think there is much more research that can be done in this field so thank you very much for being here thank you besides for having me here and I uh, hope you have a lovely conference uh, if you have any questions I'll be happy to answer not everyone at once please yeah So the question is, what kind of software we use to get the data? So what uh, my company do is uh, it has a web application firewall. Uh, It has many customers. So we we get the data from seeing this kind of logs. Uh, This data is not publicly available, unfortunately. Uh, I think he's saying, well, what what do you use to process that data? Ah, to process the data? Yeah. Ah, okay. Um... So there are many machine learning libraries uh, uh, that are uh, open and mostly in Python and we use mostly Python to do it. Uh, the scikit-learn, this very popular one uh, for deep learning. If you want to use deep learning, there are many others, TensorFlow uh, or uh, PyTorch or uh, Dynet, if you know. So, so there are many different resources, and we use mostly mostly Python to, to process the data. Did that answer it? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so you explained my structure, the non-structure, uh, machine learning. But have you 
how she was looking into like neural networks and where do you see that going? Do you see any uh, benefits in using neural networks with deep learning? Yeah, okay, the, the, that's a good question. Uh, the, the question was uh, with uh, supervised and unsupervised learning, and uh, w w will we see uh, any, f any research in, uh, related to neural networks? And I think there's, there's much to do related to neural networks. Uh, one feature that is uh, especially uh, required in neural, neural, neural networks is that you need a lot of data for the neural network algorithm to work. And the problem here is that we don't have data. And also, usually neural networks works in the uh, structured way, in the supervised learning uh, methods. And we don't have much labeled data here. And that's actually a big problem in many other fields of research related to neural networks, that we don't have enough data. So if someone comes up with a lot of data, uh, somehow they might <coughs> do something really fascinating and really brilliant related to neural networks in this field. So, yeah. Do you find this works well when attackers spoof their user agent, their IP? So, so yeah, yeah. Actually, we find a lot of stories related to attacker spoofing the user agent. Uh, we saw a cluster uh, where the attackers tried to create many different user agents, but they all, they all always had the same prefix and uh, use some kind of randomized uh, suffix. So if we use some kind of Levenstein distance, it, it will catch it. Uh, if the attackers are completely randomizing the user agent, I don't know, writing gibberish over there, then the leverage net distance won't work, but we still have a lot of other features. Uh, usually attackers uh, either have some kind of pattern in the URL, uh, we also have had other methods to find the tool, not only the user agent. For example, we can look at which header exists and which doesn't, the order of the headers, uh, the attack methods. So, Basically, the algorithm doesn't rely on a single feature. That's, let's say, the one of the biggest advantages of it. How many features? Yeah. Th that's a great question. Uh, how, how do you measure success of the algorithm, right? Because th that's basically uh, uh, th that's a basic problem in all unsupervised learning algorithms, where you don't have some kind of benchmark that you can compare it to. So. One way to, to, to do it is to create a benchmark, mm -hmm. like create yourself, a, let's say you take a data set, you cluster it somehow, and then you use your algorithm on, a, on the data set, uh, and you can compare it to them. Another method is to, um, let's say, get feedback from users mm -hmm. of the algorithm, right? Give them the algorithm and listen to what they say. Uh, another method that we actually we use quite a lot is uh, we, we let a researcher test the algorithm on many data sets and see whether they work good or not according to what he said. Uh, and if someone has a lot of domain knowledge, then uh, it might work that way. But there's no one great way to find uh, whether it works. Yeah. But that was actually my question, but build up on the same question. So have you done either one of the, what, the, the methods that you mentioned right now? And based on that, do you know how accurate this is now? Like, what's the rate of false positives, if, if at all? Um, it depends how you, uh, how, how you define false positives. Because false positives can be uh, two events that should be in the same cluster, but they're not, or two events that... Let's just, let's just define it as a, a story that this thing tells us based on the logs gathered, which is not accurate to what we want. So essentially it's telling us something which didn't really happen. So is it, does it have that level of accuracy as of now, based on mm. the research that you have done? Okay, so, so basically um, we did a couple of benchmarks, and the algorithm worked pretty well on these benchmarks, but we used the twitching on this benchmark and we also tested it on them, so we expect them to work well. Uh, I can't give you a specific number, like X uh, percent false positives, um, um, but, but yeah, but it's pretty accurate to what we see in the data. Um, no. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so Distance-based uh, clustering algorithms uh, could have this disadvantage that they uh, tend to prefer uh, matches which has uh, 
larger number of dimensions uh, which agree. Uh, so did you observe this effect? Like, I, I, I mean, uh, you, you, you could sometimes miss the cluster, which would be based only on few dimensions if, if you have some number of okay. dimensions. So did you observe this problem? That's the one question and the other. Uh, have you considered also some other approach approaches for clustering the distant planes? Um, <coughs> okay, so to answer the first question, um, yeah, we, we observed a couple of uh, problems related to this, but if you choose the algorithm correctly, then let's say you can have like an alert A, which is close to alert B in, in a couple of features, and alert B close to alert C in a couple of other features, and they will all be in the same cluster, and you get some kind of chain of of, of alerts in the same cluster. So if you do, if you choose the algorithm correctly, it will uh, solve this kind of problem. It depends also if you want it in, in a result. Sometimes it is something that you don't want, uh, but we, we used it. Um, and remind me just the second question. The second question, if you are considering some other uh, approaches ah. to clustering than uh, the distant phase. Yeah. I'll, I'll just answer. Uh, so uh, no, we didn't. We didn't uh, consider the, any, any clustering methods that are not distance based. I don't think I know clustering methods that are not distance based. I mean, in any clustering, you need some kind of distance measure. Uh, you have some kind of proximity, or, but, but you, you usually uh, need to consider distances between data points. I think. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll be happy to, to know otherwise. Uh, so th thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm still here, but I need to finish. Uh, so thanks. <laughs>